seated. Hope that's your prayer this morning, that the Lord would meet us here again. I, I really do believe that the Lord has something to say to his people gathered here this morning. We are continuing our series through the Gospel of Mark called Good News. As we've been outlining several times through Mark's Gospel, um, he refers to this phrase, good news. And once again, we see it here in Mark chapter 8, which is a bit of a pivotal portion in the entire book. So I believe that the Lord is going to speak with us this morning, and I want us to really have a heart that is leaning in and intending to hear from the Lord. The message title this morning, if you're taking notes, is Hidden in Plain Sight, and that will become evident in just a moment. Let's pray and ask for God's help. Father, we just sung it. And now we pray it. Will you meet us here again? Oh, Lord, we need to hear the voice of the shepherd. We need eyes to see. Would you speak powerfully to us from your word? And would you cause us to respond in kind? Lord, let this not be a passive affair. Hide me behind the cross of Christ. Exalt the name that is above every name. Give us a fresh vision of Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. You know, some companies in recent years have both subtly and ingeniously hidden symbols or signs in their logos that at first glance you may not see them, but they are hidden in plain sight. Let me give you a couple of examples right here. You have this one right here, which of course is FedEx. And some of you guys who haven't seen this before, your mind's about to go. Have you ever noticed between the E and the X in X, what do you see there? And there, anybody not see that before? Okay, no. Okay, all right. Very good. All right. No, never see it. You see it now. Okay. No. Yes. Okay. All right. There it is. And it's been there the whole time, y'all. Hidden in plain sight. Here's another one right here. This is, of course, anybody know this logo? It's the Milwaukee Brewers. And at first glance, it looks like a what? Baseball glove. But if you look very carefully, the top of the glove is the letter, and the bottom of the glove is the letter for Milwaukee Brewers. One more is, of course, everyone's favorite, Baskin Robbins. And have you noticed those pink portion of the letters are not only part of the B and R, but it's also the number 31, which represents Baskin Robbins original 31 flavors. And there you have it, Kira. I know your life has changed. You will never be the same. You have met with the Lord this morning. Amen. Let's go home. That's right. That's right. Well, I bring this up because it, it illustrates a reality that it is possible, especially if your name is Kira, to see something without really seeing something, right? Jesus, in fact, himself goes after this idea and talks about a spiritual sense that it's possible to see without seeing. For instance, in Matthew's gospel, chapter number 13, verse 14, Jesus says this, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not, what? See. And then here in Mark 8, Jesus raises a very similar question with his disciples. Do you have eyes and not? What Jesus is emphasizing is that it is possible to see him correctly without seeing him completely. Let me say that one more time because this is really critical. It is possible to see him correctly without seeing him completely. Let me unpack that for just a moment. At this point in Mark's Gospels, the disciples have been exposed to Jesus. And they've learned some very significant things about him. In fact, it is right here in Mark chapter 8 where Peter utters perhaps his most famous confession. Mark chapter 8, verse number 29, Peter simply says, You are the Messiah. I mean, that seems like that is a theologically loaded theologically accurate statement. Let me ask you a question. Is this correct? Yes or no? Absolutely. And yet, according to Jesus, even though Peter has uttered, you are the Messiah, Jesus is saying about Peter, 
you still don't see. That is, though his disciples had some correct information about him, they didn't have the whole picture yet. To drive this point home, Jesus performs perhaps his most unusual miracle in all of the Bible. You say, why, why is it so unusual? Let's, let's look at it here together. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse number 22. They came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village. Spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? What's going on here? Well, up to this point in the story, I would call this an SIM, a standard issue miracle. Nothing unusual going on here. This is just how Jesus typically relates to people, lays his eyes, spits on the ground. This is not out of, out of character for Jesus at all. But then in verse number 24, things start to get weird. Look at what it says. He looked up and said, I see people and they look like trees walking. Hold the phone. What just happened here? Did the miracle not take? Was Jesus like having an off day? Was his divine mojo not up to snuff? He's trying his best, but man, oh man, I better give that another try. Like strike one, Jesus. What is going on here? Is Jesus out of whack? I don't think so. Look at what happens in the next verse, and I'll unpack this just a little bit more. Verse number 25. Again, Jesus placed his, his hands on the man's eyes, and the man looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. All right, so Jesus goes back the second time, even though the first time didn't seem to work, and now the man can actually see. What's happening? I think Jesus healed the man in this way because he is trying to illustrate a profound spiritual truth, namely this. Sometimes spiritual sight comes in stages. I think that's what Jesus is trying to show us here. Sometimes spiritual sight comes in stages. That's what's happening in the disciples' life. And we'll unpack this more in just a minute. Let me give you an illustration to kind of drive home what I mean. I just recently, in the last year or so, joined the glasses wearing club. Anybody part of that esteemed group? Very good. Yes, it stinks. It's really hard for preaching, unless you think this makes me look profound. You know, I don't know. But when you go in and get an eye exam and they put this machine on your face that looks like some sort of alien contraption made for sucking your brains out, you know that one? What they do is they click, 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 and they're going through lens after lens, and they ask the question, is that clear? Is that clear? Is that clear? And what is their intent? They're trying to get your vision as sharp as possible, and clicking through this progressions, in one sense, they're trying to help you see in stages. And that's what's going on with the disciples. Was Jesus the Messiah, yes or no? Yes. Did Peter see that accurately? But did he see Jesus completely yet? No, well, that's going to be real clear in just a minute. The point is simply this. We must all see Jesus clearly. That's God's desire for all of us. To not just have some accurate facts about Jesus kind of filed away in our memory. Some theological tidbits that we could share about Jesus. But Jesus really wants to reveal himself to us not just accurately, not just correctly, but completely. So no matter where you're at, at your spiritual journey, whether this is your very first time in church, you've never darkened the doors of a church before, or you've been here so long that I can just predict where you're sitting. Derek, there he is. Look at that. Yeah, every time, right? There it is. You're right there. It's on the left hand of cursing. Bad seat, brother. Bad seat. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter where you are. The idea is simply this. We all need a clearer picture of Jesus. And let me warn you. Sometimes the reason that our vision of Jesus is a bit out of focus is because when you look carefully at him, you don't like what you see. 
And this is where you let out the collective gasp. Say it together. Gasp. Well, I would, pastor, I, I would never. I would never make a Jesus in my own image. I would never try to change the character of Jesus so it fits my expectation. Hold your outrage for one moment because this is exactly the error that the disciples fell into. They wanted Jesus to fit the mold. They wanted a Messiah that met their preconceived expectation. And when Jesus did none of those things, it was a struggle for them to really see him. But this war was not just an ancient problem. It's a modern one as well. People are striving in the words of the great foundation of theology, Depeche Mode. Anybody know who they are? It's a really old band. Consistently trying to craft your own personal Jesus. Are you guilty? You know, making a Jesus who cares but he never commands. A Jesus who's kind, but he's not king. A Jesus who's loving, but he's not holy. Friends, this is not the Jesus of Scripture. The Jesus of the Bible is not one-dimensional. He is multifaceted. And if we are to see him clearly, friends, we got to see all of them. Yes, the Jesus of the Bible did say things like, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. That is so precious. But this same Jesus also said, don't assume that I come to bring peace on earth. I do not come to bring peace. I come with a sword. Yes, Jesus did say, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such of these. But don't forget that Jesus also said, if you don't forgive others, your God will not forgive you. Jesus is kind, but he's king. Jesus is generous, but he's also just. He is a friend. He is also fierce. Jesus is not a one-dimensional person. People are free to reject or ridicule Jesus, but they may not tame him. He is who he is. Listen, can I say this very kindly? Christ will not be domesticated. You cannot make a Christ in your own image. You cannot make a God just like you want him to be. Sometimes you will look at Christ and find him unbelievably beautiful. And other times, if you look carefully, you will find him offensive. That is who he is. And if we're to see him clearly, we got to see all of them. We got to embrace even the parts that our society doesn't find palatable today. Even the kind of, Jesus doesn't need a PR firm. He needs believers to embrace him who he is. To say, we're not going to dress Jesus up. We are going to say, who is he? And let us bow our knee to him. This was a hard lesson for the disciples to learn. And it's one we must learn as well. While there are certainly aspects of Jesus' character that everybody universally finds appealing, right? Like there's certain parts of Jesus that everybody loves. But there are other parts of Jesus that the disciples and our culture and even we ourselves sometimes find hard to accept. But we must because that is who he is. It is a couple of those attributes that I want to hone in on here. Lord willing, from this passage of scripture, some aspects of the character of Jesus that may be hard to accept. Number one, first one is this, Jesus is Savior. Now you may say, Ryan, that doesn't seem hard to accept at all. That's kind of a warm and fuzzy side of Jesus. Why would that be hard to accept? Let me unpack this just a bit and maybe convince you otherwise that accepting Jesus as the Savior may not be as warm and fuzzy as you first expect. Remember in this passage, Peter has just made his wonderful confession. You are the, what does he say? Messiah. Oh man, that is a good one. You are the Messiah. I mean, it certainly appears that Peter gets it. You're like, man, if you are confessing Christ, if you're confessing that Jesus is the Messiah, I mean, Peter is on the home team. 
He's got it together. He knows who Jesus is. He has embraced his identity. Peter really gets it. But what the next verse makes abundantly clear is Peter does not get it at all. We're going to see that very next. Look at what it says here, verse number 31. Then he, Jesus, began to teach that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. So Jesus starts talking about his death, his rejection, and his resurrection. Now, look, if you know the story of Jesus at all, you know that like his death and resurrection are pretty central to what goes on in his life. Like we all know that. So if Peter is confessing Jesus as the Messiah, you would think that Peter's like, yeah, I'm on board with that. It's good. Yeah, you got to die, rise again. Yeah, that's part of why he came, Jesus. I'm, I'm on board. But Peter is not on board. In fact, what does the text say? Look at verse number 33, 32. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is not Peter's finest hour. Number one, one does not take Jesus aside. One does not request a sidebar with Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Just a word, just a word. No, you don't do that, number one. Number two, one never, I repeat, never rebukes Jesus. And that's exactly what Peter did. Hey, I appreciate at least that he took him aside to do it. But, but if you really understand who Jesus is, it would seem that you understand that you don't rebuke Jesus. I mean, that's like part of his role. He is the king. He is the Lord. He is God. You do not rebuke Jesus. So Jesus turns the table on his would-be follower but turning around and looking at his disciples, he, Jesus, rebuked Peter. Oh, you're going to rebuke me, Peter. No, 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 I'm going to rebuke you. Get behind me. What's it say? Woo! Get behind me. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but about human concerns. Wowza. That's a Greek term. That's smarts. I mean, it's not just like, hey, you're a little off base here, buddy. Tone it down a notch. It's get behind me, devil. So what's going on in this exchange? Well, I need to answer two questions in order to really understand that. First question is this, why did Peter rebuke Jesus? Well, the answer to that question is fairly simple. It's this, Jesus didn't meet Peter's expectations. You see, when Peter said, you're the Messiah, he's like, you're my meal ticket, bro. You're giving me power. You're giving me influence. You're going to make my life better. You're going to make my life more comfortable. You are my ticket. I am on your coattails all the way. I'm riding you just to the top. And so Jesus starts saying, well, Peter, I got to die. And Peter's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Not part of the plan. How am I supposed to get to the Oval Office if you don't precede me? You are the gravy train. He didn't meet his expectations. Peter put Jesus in the balance and he was wanting. Jesus, let me take you aside, have a little word with you. So then why did Jesus rebuke Peter? Well, at first it's somewhat obvious. Like it's like, well, yeah, obviously... You know, Jesus came to die and Peter's wrong. Like he had to come in and die. But why all the heat? Why get behind me Satan? Why not just like Peter, slow your roll? Like why get behind me I mean, that had to sting. Here's why. The primary reason why Jesus was sent into the world was not to make our lives more convenient, was not to be our teacher, although he is a teacher. Was not to be our example, although he is our example. The primary reason that Jesus came into the world was to die for sinners. Anything, 
any idea, any thought process, any individual that pushes back against that central mission is demonic. Because Jesus came to save. What Peter was unwittingly, unwittingly doing was undermining humanity's only hope for salvation. And so Jesus says to that, get behind me, Satan. You are thinking man's thoughts and not the things of God. I didn't come to live an easy life. I didn't come here to give you an easy life. I came to die. Mark chapter 10, verse number 45. For the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is central to the purpose of Jesus. Listen, friends. I say this really, really plainly in the cultural Christianity of the South. Jesus didn't come to give you a nice life. He came to give you an eternal one. There is a world of difference between those two things. Jesus did not come to give you a nice life. He came to give you an eternal one. The reality is Jesus came to save. You stop and think about that for a moment. I told you this is hard to accept. Why is it hard to accept that Jesus came to save? Because that statement itself is an indictment on you. If you acknowledge that Jesus came to save, at the same time you are saying, I need saving. Acknowledging that Jesus is the Savior means admitting that you are a sinner. And that's why it's hard to accept that Jesus is the Savior. Some people like to say Jesus is the Savior, but they've never acknowledged that they are a sinner and therefore they ain't saved. One follows the other. If you don't acknowledge your need of saving, then Jesus will not and cannot save you. Acknowledging that Jesus is the Savior requires admitting that you are a sinner. Peter received the rebuke in part because he was cutting off all of us from hope. Jesus did not come to earth to give direction to essentially good people. He came to give life to spiritually dead people. Acknowledging Jesus is the Savior is hard to accept because it means we must accept our own bankruptcy. The cross was not a tragedy, unfortunate. It was a purposeful masterpiece of God's grace to rescue people like you and me. When you discount the cross, you dishonor the Christ. Friends, Jesus came to die for you. Because you needed it. And that's hard to accept sometimes. You see, seeing Jesus came primarily to save sinful people may be difficult to embrace. But our vision of Jesus, listen, listen. Our vision of Jesus, and this is going on in our society all over the place, will be blurry at best if you leave out or misunderstand the fundamental reason he hung on the cross. To rescue broken humanity. To make dead people live. We need Jesus as savior because we all, every single man, woman, boy, and girl that has ever breathed a breath of air on the planet earth needs a savior. We're broken, we're sinful, and that's hard for me. That's hard for you to accept. Embracing Jesus clearly and seeing him for who he is means we acknowledge that we are sinners. Look, the cross will always be foolish until you see your need for it. If you don't think you need the cross, if you don't recognize the desperateness of your condition, you'll look at the cross of Christ and look at it as a tragedy or silliness or a waste. But if you recognize the brokenness of your soul, 
the inability of your own heart to change itself. The inaccessibility of, of God apart from some mediator on your behalf. If you do not see those things, the cross will be folly. But when you do, the cross becomes beauty, glory, holiness. Friends, it is hard to accept that Jesus is the Savior because it means that we need saving. Number two. It's also hard to accept that Jesus is the Lord. Perhaps unsurprisingly, after Jesus declared his unswerving commitment to go to the cross, he calls his followers to do the same. Look at what it says in Mark chapter 8, verse number 34. If anyone wants to follow me, listen to this, anyone, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, what do you got to do? You got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. To put it plainly, listen to this statement, it's really critical. Embracing the Savior means embracing suffering. If you want to follow the path of Jesus, it includes suffering. If you want to be a Christian, it's hard. If you want to go to heaven, it will include pain. I just want us to get that out in the open. Like the Bible says this over and over again, but we all need to embrace this reality that the path of Jesus is the path of suffering. And it's not often the suffering that we think. Sometimes we think, well, if I'm going to trust Christ, then, you know, I'm going to get persecution from out there. That may come and sometimes does. But the reality is, is the vast majority of suffering that comes in following Christ is exactly what Jesus says, deny yourself. If you are following Jesus, it means you must get off the throne of your life. And let's be honest, a lot of us have our arms on that chair with white knuckles. We may not want to be the president of the United States, but you definitely want to be the president of you. Following Jesus means that we die to autonomy. He calls the shots. We don't. That's exactly what Jesus says here. If you want to follow me, what you got to do? You got to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. It is a road of suffering in following the Savior. But Jesus is no masochist. He doesn't call us to suffer for suffering's sake. Rather, there's a rationale, there's a logic to following Jesus. So I want you to really think, aim your brains, think very reasonably, rationally, logically here. Here is the offer that Jesus puts on the table. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life because of me, and here it is, and the gospel will find it or will save it. In other words, we gain by losing. That's Jesus' economy right there. We gain by losing. That is, if you attempt to save your life by pursuing all that the world has to offer, and the world does have a good bit to offer, by the way, so you try to save your life by pursuing comfort, by pursuing the American dream, by pursuing living as your own authority, by pursuing obeying the parts of the Bible that you like and ignoring the parts you don't like. Popular today? Yes. By pursuing money or fame or relaxation or a nice family. Idols can be all kinds of things. Idols are often good things we want too much. Idols are often good things we want too much. If you try to hold on to this life according to the Savior, you lose. Everything that you held in your hand, you will lose. You can't take it with you. 
But, but, on the other hand, if you give it all right now and submit to King Jesus, you gain. And then Jesus is like, look, let me shoot straight with you. Let me reason with you. Look at what he says in the next verse there. He's like, look, I just told you what it is. Now let me persuade you with some cold, hard facts. For what benefit, I'm sorry, for what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet you lose his life? And the answer is, okay, that wasn't very emphatic. What benefit is it? N none. Then he poses another question. What can anyone give in exchange for his life? And the answer is, Jesus is like, think. Please. If you try to save your life, you lose it. And if it's gone, it's gone. If you try to save your life by pursuing the things that this world has to offer, you lose. But if on the other hand, whew, if on the other hand, you give your life, you lose your life now, you save it in eternity. Then Jesus uses this powerful image. We don't even think of it as an image because we've religiosityed the word. That's not a word, but I just made up another one. The word cross, right? When I say the word cross, we think of a symbol, right? And, and it's like kind of like a, a precious symbol or a anesthetized symbol, if you were. You know, in fact, how many of you have like a cross piece of jewelry on today? Okay, yeah, a few of you, good. How many of you have a cross tattoo somewhere? Okay, if you haven't told your mama yet, I mean, don't, you don't have, like, I'm not asking you to confess. But like, these are things we do. We, you know, tattoo a little cross or wear a cross on a gold chain or gold earring. Nothing wrong with that, by the way, no problem. But you got to understand before Jesus went to the cross, the cross would have had a very different association. It would have been thought of as a, as a torture device. It'd be like somebody rolling up in here and being like, man, you like my new necklace? What is that? That's a guillotine. We'd be like, you're sick. Go take that off. There's a church down the road for you. Yeah, yeah right. Or somebody comes rolling in, check out my new tat. What is it? It's an electric chair. Brother, you're going places. <laughs> no, that's weird because we understand what that means. It is an object of death, of torture. And when Jesus says, hey, you want to follow me? Take up your guillotine. Take up your electric chair. What is he saying? Die. You want to follow me? Die. I can't improve on the words of the German martyr Diedrich Bonhoeffer. When Christ calls a man, he calls him to come and die. Oh, friends, that's hard to accept. But it is the God honest truth. If you want to follow Jesus, you must die. It doesn't say if you want to follow Jesus, you got to go to church. It doesn't say if you want to follow Jesus, you got to give a couple bucks in the offering every now and again. It doesn't say if you want to follow Jesus, you can't smoke or chew or go with girls that do. It doesn't say if you want to follow Jesus, you got to keep your nose clean. You got to be a good guy or a good woman. It says if you want to follow Jesus, you must die. At root, Jesus is inviting everyone who follows him to the path of delayed gratification. Say, so what do you mean by that? Well, here it is. Here's the equation, if you were. Jesus says, if you try to save this temporary life, you lose life for all eternity. That's the equation. If you save now temporary life, you lose eternal life. However, 
if you lose temporary life, you gain eternal life. That's Jesus' offer. There it is. You just lay it on the table. If you try to hang on right now, live as your own king, call your own shots, be your own master, do what you want to do, take little parts of Jesus that you find palatable and reject the parts that you don't, Come to church, keep your nose clean, stay out of trouble, but never really bow your knee to the Lord. You lose forever. But if you say, oh, you really want that, Jesus? All of me. Lord, that's hard. All of it? Dang it. I mean, my friends are... What are they going to say about me? What's my, fa- what's my family going to say? They're going to think I'm some sort of crazy fanatic. You know that's going to cost me money, God. You know, I like me a little... You want that too? And then you say, all right, all right, all right. You gained it all. Yeah, you might have lost for a moment. You gained it all. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his very soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. My plea with you is the same as the words of the Savior right now. Lose your life that you may gain an eternal one forever. Here's what's even more hard to accept about all of this. Jesus has the right to call us to this because of who he is. He's like, that's a hard bargain. Yes, but he's God. He makes the rules. He calls the shots. Here's what it says. When the son of man comes in his glory, Matthew chapter 25, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. Just as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. Look at what it says here. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king, that's Jesus, will say to those on his right, come, Come, you are who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared before you for the, before the foundation of the world. In other words, you lost your life. You gave your life. Now you gain eternal life. It's yours. You lost your life. You gain life. And the reverse is also true. Then he will also say to those on the left... Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You already had your life, and now you've lost eternal life. He's the guy sitting on the throne, he's the Son of Man. He has the authority to call us to this because at the end of the day, you will stand before Jesus. Every knee will bow before Christ, either a savior or judge. Those are our options, friends. I just wanna plead with you right now, lose your life so you can gain an eternal one. Don't hang on to this temporary passing vapor Because when you do so, you lose the opportunity to gain life that really matters. We can't just have part of Jesus. It's not how it works. He is Messiah, but he's also master. He is redeemer, but he's also ruler. He is savior and he is the sovereign. He is Lord. Look, friends, Jesus will not take an advisory role in your life. 
He will not be a valued team member. He will not be your co-pilot. Jesus didn't come to help generally good people find a little direction. He came to rescue spiritually dead people. We must bow our need in submission to the one who is Lord. Listen to this statement very carefully. Christ will be Lord of all or not at all. You can't take a piece of Jesus. That's what the disciples were trying to do. He didn't fit their category, so they're like, whoa, whoa, hey, whoa, whoa. I don't, I don't, understand. I don't get it. I don't like it. Are you perhaps doing the same thing? Are there areas in your life where perhaps you are domesticating Jesus? You've made him a little more to your liking. You got him a PR firm, you know? Just dress up his image a little bit so he looks a little more appealing to you. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. He is Lord and he demands our all. So where does this leave us? Well, if we truly want to embrace Jesus, we must see him clearly, including those aspects that are hard to accept. This means first, we must see him as Savior, which includes confessing that you are in need of saving. Jesus didn't come to help good people get a little better, to moderately improve your life, to help you reach self-actualization. He didn't come for any of those things. He came to make spiritual corpses members of the family. And we got to confess that. It's who we were. We need a savior. Second, if you want to see him clearly, you got to see him as Lord. This means he's not your co-pilot. He's not your bestie. Jesus doesn't sit in the back seat, friends. He doesn't sit in the passenger seat. He sits in the driver's seat or not in the car. There's only one seat that Jesus will take up. He is boss. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He is the Lord. So my question is this, will you embrace that Jesus this morning? Not the Jesus who demands nothing of you. Not the Jesus who passively rubber stamps everything you do, but the Jesus who hates sin and loves sinners so much that he died for them. Can you you think about like what the cross means? It means that Jesus passionately despises sin. So much so that he's willing to pay the ultimate price to rescue his people from their sins. Will you embrace that Jesus? Not the Jesus that's a figment of your imagination. Will you see the Jesus who is generous and just, who is master and Messiah, who is kind and king? Will you embrace that Jesus today? With all his edges, with all the difficult parts to understand, will you turn to him? I'm going to invite us to respond, really honestly respond this morning as the band comes and gets ready to play. I want to challenge us kind of with the illustration, and then I want to give you two ways to respond to what we've heard this morning. You know, in the, um, in the Chronicles of Narnia, the kind of overarching figure in, that, in those stories is, is Aslan, who's the Lion King. He's the Christ figure in the book, and he's this powerful ruler, the king of Narnia. And when the children are introduced to this idea that the lion is the king, they rightly have some questions. So Lucy, the little girl in the story, asks this question. Is he safe? The response she gets is this. Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. He's wild. He's no tame lion. Here's what I want to say to you this morning. Jesus isn't safe. He's not tame. He will demand of you far more than you can imagine. You cannot put him in a little box. You can't put a collar on him. You can't put him on a leash. He is wild. 
but he's good. And he can be trusted. And some of you, friends, you've just been related to this fake Jesus. I don't want to be unkind. It was very tempting for us in cultural Christianity in the South to create a Jesus of our own design. And I want to tell you, the Jesus of the Bible, he's not domesticated. He makes you tremble a bit. He's terrifying in some ways. But he's good. Oh, he's oh so good. And he has your best interest at heart. Interest that you don't even know you have sometimes. He is so committed to your good that he will pursue it at all cost, even if it means wounding you in the process. He's not safe. So will you run to him this morning? Then I got two ways I want to invite you to respond. Prayer team standing by right now, these folks would be delighted to pray with you. First one is this. Will you surrender to Jesus? Man, maybe you've just never bowed your knee to the king. Maybe you in your mind have really been bowing your knee to some anesthetized, domesticated version of Jesus who demands nothing of you. Just affirms you right where you are. Come to me, stay where you are. That's not Jesus of the Bible. He is a consuming fire. And maybe today for the first time, your eyes have been opened just a little bit. You're like, whoa, this Jesus is someone I'm not acquainted with, but I would like to get to know him. That's scary, but it also sounds wonderful at the same time. Like jumping out of a plane. Man, that's terrifying, but it's gonna be a ride. Friends, would you bow your knee to King Jesus this morning? Or maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a while and you just have realized this morning there have been areas of your life where you have just kind of kept Jesus at bay. Hey, don't touch that. Jesus, yeah, you're king, but you know, I'm gonna leave this, this part of my life over here. This is me. We good, right? We good, Jesus, right? We good? You're not good. He'll be, he'll be Lord of all or not at all. We can't chop him up. Say, I like this part of the Bible. This part of the Bible, not so much. Maybe you need to say, man, Lord's exposing an area of my life that's just not surrendered to Jesus today. And I need to talk to him about that. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your sexuality. Maybe it's relationships. I don't know what it is. But is there an area in your life where you've essentially said to the Lord, off limits? Can I encourage you to surrender to him this morning? Second thing is this. I want to encourage you to not just surrender to Jesus, but share Jesus. Maybe if you've heard this, you're like, man, there is a name, there is a person on my heart that I know has not seen Jesus like this. And by God's grace, I need to be obedient and share. Share about the wondrous nature of my king with someone else. And God's just placed them on your heart and you need to seek God on it. Here's how I'm going to invite you to to come. Team's going to come up here. They're going to start singing. And I want you to move. I want you to move. There's folks in the room that would love to pray with you. Maybe you need to pray right there in your seat. Maybe you need to grab somebody. I want to encourage us not to walk out of here the same, but to really do business with the Lord. You don't got to walk back there to go pray, but it might be a good good idea to draw a line in the sand, put a marker in the ground, just to say like, Lord, I mean business about this. And I want to remember in my mind that I need to obey you in this particular way. Let's be honest with our king. He deserves it, right? He's worthy, is he not? We should worship him with our lives. So let's do business with the Lord. I'm going to pray. We're going to play quietly here for just a moment. I want you to move in that, and then we're going to sing together. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. He is so good. Lord, forgive us for not liking what we see sometimes. Forgive us for saying, man, that's hard to accept. Questioning your goodness and your wisdom in our life. Lord, I pray that we would just bow our need in surrender to you right now. Lord, if somebody in here doesn't know Jesus, I pray that, I just pray your spirit would be moving in them. You would open their eyes, just like you did the blind man. Open our eyes that we may see the wonder of Jesus and bow our knee and surrender to him. 
Lord, I pray for our friends and neighbors that we would be instruments of proclaiming who you are. Lord, show yourself to us in this moment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand on our feet. Feel free to move right now to those folks in the back.